Hi, I'm George Norrie, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. As you know, on this program, we explore mysteries that rightly or wrongly, are characterized as paranormal, something outside the parameters of science, too wacky to be taken seriously by some, so foreign to our everyday experiences in life that they often take a back seat to more mundane but more pressing matters, such as just going to work, paying the bills, mowing the lawn. Tonight, we'll try to tackle the biggest questions of all, namely, what is our place in the universe? Where do we fit in the cosmic order? You know, what's the seating chart, uh, the pecking order? If there are other unseen intelligences interacting with us, what's their intent? And why us? Why do they have such an intense, long-standing interest in our little lives? I often hear people say they're ready for the truth. Well, let me have it. Give me the goods. They want disclosure. They want someone to peel back the curtain and tell them what's really going on. And my reply sometimes is, are you sure? You're ready for what to be disclosed exactly, because maybe there are parts of these mysteries that would be so disturbing that would they would basically change everything and might not be so easy for us to absorb, let alone to accept. You know, it's one thing to go out and uh, search the skies for UFOs, do a little UFO outing, Uh, looking for thrilling but seemingly harmless bright lights flitting around in the sky. Uh, Sometimes uh, you'll see a witness, be a witness to, uh, you know, like what looks like a distinct craft. And uh, every once in a while, uh, eyewitnesses will see glimpses of what they think of as alien beings. But amorphous fleeting images in the sky that, that seem to mean us no harm, it's quite another thing altogether to come face to face with the unknown to have it inside your home in your in your room in your face maybe even inside your body in ways that are incredibly invasive even violent it's uh, described as something akin to rape by some of those to whom it's happened people who've had the so-called abduction experience often report symptoms similar to post-traumatic stress disorder as defined by soldiers returning from battle in a nutshell These folks are genuinely messed up. Something did it to them, but what was it? It's perhaps the most disturbing aspect of our pursuit of the unknown, uh, our search for the truth, because this is so personal for those involved and so hard for the rest of us to believe. Tonight, we explore what might be the most intense, most troubling abduction case of all, one that involved not just one or two bewildered individuals, but a large number of people all seemingly plucked from the same place, which turns out to be a UFO conference in a historic building, a location that was at the same time where a former president and his Secret Service delegation were visiting. How these details came spilling out is uh, quite a detective story. This evening we'll hear from three of the people who were there and who have conscious memories of the bizarre events of a prophetic weekend on Coronado Island, just off the Pacific coast near San Diego. And, uh, you know, in my view, this is a gripping tale, as described in a new book by the principal investigator, Yvonne Smith. Yvonne will be my guest coming up in just a couple of minutes. And then in the second half of the program tonight, we'll be joined by two of the people who say they were taken out of their rooms at the Hotel Del Coronado. Jesse Long will be making his Coast to Coast debut He'll tell us about a a lifetime of weird encounters, plus what happened to him on the island. And then Melinda Leslie, who is no stranger to this program, was also on the island, says she was not only taken that night, but remembers seeing some of the other abductees while they were in the clutches of these visitors. It's quite a story. Yvonne Smith is no newcomer to the UFO mystery. She started working on it as a researcher in the late 80s, became a certified hypnotherapist in 1990, and has helped hundreds of people dealing with the very real consequences of their encounters with the unknown. 
She founded something called CERO, C-E-R-O, Close Encounters Resource Organization. And it's not only been a framework for investigating abductions and UFOs, but also support for those to whom this happens. She is a contemporary and colleague of the giants in the field, John Mack, Bud Hopkins, David Jacobs, and others. And her new book, Coronado, The President, The Secret Service, and Alien Abductions is just out. And it's a page turner. Yvonne, good to have you back. Thank you, George. It's a pleasure to be back. Thank you for having me on. You know, before we, I, I want to ask some questions in this hour about the abduction scenario in general, the kinds of uh, of questions that you get asked and, and criticisms that you get asked uh, all the time. But first, perhaps you could sort of set the table for us, the date and location of this mass abduction, who was involved, kind of give us the broad strokes, and then we'll get to the specifics later. Well, this uh, occurred back in March, a uh, weekend in March 26, 27, 1994, uh, during that time, the Triad organization was, and I don't, re- I don't know if you remember that organization, George, but um, it was putting on um, conferences all over the United States. And this yeah, it was Bob Bigelow, right? Bob Bigelow, Bigelow sponsored right. these conferences. And this is where John Mack and myself and Bud and David Jacobs, we'd all uh, travel together. With this particular conference, um, they asked me, the organizers asked me to MC the conference since it was practically in my backyard in San Diego on Coronado Island. So I was there. Um, we have, of course, the, you know, um, speakers that, wonderful speakers we have. We've had all these years at conferences. Um, we've had, uh, um, gosh, there are so many. I should have had my list in front of me, but Bud was there. Colin Andrews speaking about uh, the crop circles, uh, John Carpenter, and it was just uh, an extraordinary conference because it was held at the historic Hotel Del Coronado. And during this time, my serial members decided to all caravan down to the island and and be together for the conference and meet other experiencers that came in. Um, and it just so happened that one by one, started they, they started coming up to me during that weekend, telling me that they you know they weren't feeling well, and um, one person avoided the conference altogether after paying for it uh, ahead of time to make sure he had a seat, a reservation. He didn't even want to go near the conference. Um, and, you know, I was not putting this together at the time, George, because I was so busy. As you know, when you MC, you, you have to keep everybody um, on time and, and make sure all the speakers are there. And I just, you know, did not put it together. And neither did the, um, the experiencers until after the conference when they all got home and they, a couple of them started talking to each other, you know, I think something happened, but I'm not sure. It's always that, you know, that hazy, um, you're not sure that something happened, except for the fact that there was um, physical evidence. There was blood on the pillow, and one person came away with, um, we'll call it an implant in her leg. Uh, so it was... Um, when I started putting all of this together, I realized, oh, my God, you know, this is getting to be bigger than I ever dreamed. Um, and then the fact, as you mentioned in the introduction, that then-President Bill Clinton was there along with his entourage of Secret Service. And, I see, I had the advantage of being there. I'm not – I didn't just write – the story, I had the advantage of being there myself, and I recall several uh, Secret Service agents walking around with their earpieces and sunglasses on. I mean, they stuck out like a sore thumb. I mean, they didn't look like any of the other uh, guests in the hotel. And, um, you know, they, I walked around with my UFO badge, you know, Yvonne Smith MC, Triad, you know, conference. But, you know, um, they go months in advance, and they they scope out the area where the president's going to be. They knew we were going to be there. But it was just a very strange turn of events. 
Um, and the more I started writing and putting together the transcripts, and I was still doing hypnosis, hypnotic regressions on the participants as I was writing the book because it just, it, it continues. You know, these, these experiences do not just stop. I mean, they continue throughout the person's life. This wasn't like uh, everybody came back from the conference, all got in a room and said, hey, did this happen to you? Yeah, it happened to me. And all came bursting out at once where they all realized it. I mean, it's in little tiny bits and pieces, exactly. a lot of it behind closed doors with you, right? Exactly. And um, I have the dates down of the uh, regression, the regressions after the conference believe one was, you know, somewhere a few months after the conference. I think one was a year uh, or so after the conference. It was just getting, I mean, it, there's always hints with people who are having these experiences. It's never they have a totally blank mind. They have these bits and pieces of something strange happened. They know very well that uh, in these experiences, Many times the person's awake or they're driving, but they know something strange happened. They just can't place it. Um, so it just, it just so happened that little by little, the story started forming. And then there were, uh, you know, in the very beginning, I think there were around you know, about six people who, who started coming to me and, and they were suspecting that something may have happened. And then as I was putting all this together, then I had about three other people thinking that something may have happened to them. So I wound up with about a dozen people right now at least that had experiences that weekend on Coronado Island. And I'm just, I, I suspect, George, that I may be, contacted by other people who were there who didn't even realize what was happening after they read the book. When you think about it, I mean, I can hear some wisecracker go, well, look, a UFO conference, how convenient for aliens. They could grab them all at once. They don't have to go, go around the country and pick them up at home. It's, <laughs> it's amazing it doesn't happen more often. Well, it does happen, George. It, it really does happen. Um, I have hosted the experiencer sessions at the UFO Congress a few times. And this last one, um, I mean, there's a need for support in this. You know, I had probably 60 people in this experiencer session just wanting to share their story and listening to other people. And towards the end of the week, I asked these people in the room, I mean, it was standing room only, how many people, while you've been here at the Congress, feel that something's happened to you? And I think three quarters of the room raised their hand. How much of that, so, Yvonne, how much of that is wishful thinking? People who, you know, if you're a member of CERO, your organization, you have an interest in UFOs. Man, I want to see an, an alien. I mean, that's that's you must get hit with that question a lot. Uh, is it wishful thinking that people want to be abducted so they it happens, at least in their minds? You know, um, and, you know, we've discussed this in the meetings, and people have, have come up to me and said, you know, I think that would be great. I would really wish they'd come and get me. Huh. And I say to them, you know what? You better be careful what you wish for because they really don't know how involved this is and how it affects someone's life. Um, I also had a, a long -time, long term client who – finally told them, you know, sometimes they do talk to them and thinking that, okay, maybe I'll get an answer. But she said, you know, I think I really am ready for a conscious, a totally conscious um, experience. So she said, you know, she said, okay, I'm ready. You guys want to come and, get and take my DNA, whatever you, whatever you do, that's fine. But I want to know what you're doing, and I want to be awake. And she came to me months later, and she was very traumatized because she said, I was awake, and I saw them coming in, and she absolutely fell apart. And here, she's been a, lo uh, a lifelong abductee since childhood. So it's, it's a matter of, um, you know, it's not something that's fun. Um, 
where people will say, oh, I wish that would happen to me and ha-ha and, you know, I won't come back. And, um, it, you know, it really is a serious subject and um, something that that's why I keep talking about it all these years because it really needs to be taken out of the closet completely. Um, people need to be able to talk about this freely and without the fear of losing their standing in the community or losing their jobs. You know, we're in 2014, and, you know, unfortunately, we're still talking about this taboo that about uh, people being contacted and taken by UFO occupants. But then, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're still talking about, you know, black and white in our society in 2014 when we should all be together. You know, I, I, look at how... Our society, George, how sometimes people will treat other people differently because they are different. You know, what, how would they react to aliens coming you know, in I've, and really showing I, themselves? I've interviewed a couple of dozen uh, abductees over the years, not a fraction of how many you've counseled and, and, uh, and spoken to. But I think in all, oh, there's only one of all those that I've talked to who seemed – to want this to happen and was happy about it. I don't think it really happened to her. She's describing a variety of different aliens and how pleasant it was and, Mm -hmm. and got more grandiose with these each explanation. And I think she really was talking herself into it as opposed to somebody to whom it had happened because the people who have had a genuine experience, whatever it is, are messed up. I mean, they, there are consequences to this. There are, there, uh, there are mental consequences and emotional consequences, physical sometimes, and they're they're not happy. It screws up their lives. Um, they don't know how to deal with it, and it's certainly not something they want to boast about or talk about. Well, that's that's the problem. Is they should be able to to talk about this. This should be on CNN, you know, in six o'clock news. We shouldn't have to talk about this behind closed doors anymore. And this is why, it, 22 years ago, I founded Zero the Support Group, um, because I, I realized once someone left my office, there was no one for them to talk to, not even a spouse or a family member, and they felt very isolated. And when I started my practice and, uh, and Zero the Support Group, back then in the early 90s, I mean, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have email. We were just starting to use email. Um, our phone bills were tremendous. Those of us, you know, researchers, I mean, we pay out of pocket. Yvonne, a couple of more general questions about the abduction scenario uh, to deal with, and then we'll get to specifics uh, from your book. You must hear it a lot about alternative explanations. People will say, well, these people who report this are mentally disturbed or mentally ill. They've got, they're schizophrenic. Um, they dreamed this stuff. They imagined it. Uh, it was sleep paralysis. There was a whole range of explanations for this case or that case. Um, as David uh, Jacob once told me in an interview, he said, look, it, whatever explanation, it's got to explain all of it. It's got to deal with multiple witness cases. It's got to deal with independent witness cases, uh, physical damage, and the fact, he says, that a lot of these memories are not from hypnosis. It's not induced. It's people who are conscious. So, Address for me the general uh, response you give to that panel of, uh, of explanations uh, that people try to use to dismiss this phenomena. Oh, yes, George. Everything that you had mentioned, I mean, I've been doing this now for 23 years, and I've, I've heard just about, you know, every explanation that it could possibly be, but it could not be alien abduction. Um, you know, I, I tell them, okay, sleep paralysis. These people are not always sleeping. They're driving. They're awake. They're, you know, with other people. There are many, many cases. You know, of course, the first one in, was it 61 with the Betty and Barney Hill case. They were driving. In my first book, Chosen, I had um, a, a case of two women who experienced missing time. They were driving on a busy highway. Uh, so, you know, those explanations anymore, uh, really, they, they don't cover this entire phenomenon. And this is why, um, you know, I decided it took me a long time to put together all the information for Coronado because there were so many people involved. But because there were so many people involved, um, and this happened, you know, right under the nose of, uh, you know, the elite uh, Secret Service. 
I felt that, you know, this story has to be told because I, I hear people, you know, I, I say on the, on the television or somebody being interviewed about the alien abductions, um, you know, the skeptics, and they say, why is it always someone by themselves in the middle of a cornfield? Well, obviously these people don't know you know, the details about these cases and, and, the, and the people who, who come forward bravely enough to want to find out what happened to them. You know, I've dealt with people that are um, professional people, you know, people of small walks of life, uh, professional airline pilots and, you know, doctors and, um, you know, therapists. I mean, so all these alternative explanations or things that I've heard as you have over the years, you know, it just does not fly. It does, just does not hold water anymore. And, you know, I, I had to battle over the years many skeptics and debunkers, and I don't do it anymore, George. I, I don't have time to sit there and, and battle with somebody who's completely closed minded who won't even look at the cases and study them um, in detail. No matter what evidence their, you had. Yeah, exactly, no matter what they, evidence. They have their minds made up. I love the when uh, Stan Friedman, you know, he and I have lectured many times together, and he said, you know, they, oh, yeah, they say, you know, don't bother me with the facts. My mind is made up. And that's exactly what happens. And it just, you know, you don't have time anymore uh, to deal with that. I mean, we're, we're, we're far beyond that, George. We have to... You know, we have to come forward with all of these cases, and there's so many brave people now coming forward, um, you know, coming forward because of Coronado. I'm working on um, a show pretty soon that's going, to be, that's going to be airing, I hope, with, you know, uh, with all the lucky, you know, the lucky stars, it will, and also working on a documentary about Coronado. And they're people that are willing to come forward and willing to use their real names because they feel that they need to be real about this. If, if they're to be believed, they have to be real about this when they share their story. It always struck so, me as the, one important distinction is that the people involved, in my estimation, don't want it to be real. They look for any explanation. But don't tell me I was taken by aliens and absolutely. samples. Were, they don't want it to be true. Well, they, you know, they're, in fact, I got an email today from a, a client um, who is having a very hard time dealing with the reality of this. Um, and, you know, they'll come to me and they'll say, all these years, I, I still hear it, you know, please tell me I'm crazy so I can be put in the hospital or given medication. And obviously, these people are not crazy. I mean, I get referrals from psychiatrists, you know, or other traditional therapists because they don't really know what to do with this. It's, you know, everything is in a, the, people want to put it in a nice, neat little box and tie it with a bow. And this is, you know, you can't put that, th this phenomenon in a, in a little box. It's, it's not, you know, it's not in the, uh, in the manuals, DSM manuals. It's not, I didn't learn I didn't learn to do this when I went to hypnotherapy college. I learned the basics. I learned the tools. I trained with Bud Hopkins. And at, at some point, this is going to be my, my next goal, George, is to teach, to travel the country and teach other therapists how to do this work because we don't have enough people doing this um, and taking this seriously. And there are many people – I mean, I get – emails from all over the world. I just came back from Brazil. All the stories are the same, no matter where you go. So there's a great need for, for help, uh, support groups, um, you know, just support systems. And I, I want to try to do my part in, in, in trying to train other people to do this. Let's talk about memory. Of course, that plays such a big part in, in all of this, in the stories that are told in, in your book, Coronado. Uh, what people can remember, the idea of screen memories. Now, the critics would, would scoff at that. It's ridiculous. What are you telling me, that you, you remember seeing a big-eyed owl or a deer? Mm -hmm. There's a screen memory in there. You, you can't remember this. You, your, your memory is blocked. That's ridiculous. And yet this article I just posted that I think you had a chance to read says yes. that scientists are, are on the verge of being able to do this at will, to, uh, to inject a memory, to erase a memory, to do the kinds of things that – these visitors, wherever they're from, have been able to demonstrate for a long time. Exactly. I mean, if we're doing, 
if, if these scientists are doing this now, and this article has come out, what, this month, you can imagine how long these alien beings have been doing this. I mean, I've been doing this for 23 years. I mean, Bud and David Jacobs, you know, they're both doing it. Bud was doing it, what, over 40 years, 45 years or whatever it was. And, and we, are com- we were coming out with the same details of how they can put whatever they want in your mind to make you – Feel that you're seeing, say, a um, a dead family member, rather than seeing the alien being standing in front of you. They're they're, they're placing a, a family member in front of you, or like you mentioned, a deer or an owl. And there's people that are deathly afraid of owls, um, and and um, I have I have other people that are afraid of uh, of shark shark eyes. You know, they, they just look. They said they can't even look at them, not even in a movie. Um, and, and, of course, they have no idea why they have this this fear of, like, say, you know, an owl. Why why am I fearing this, this bird? I have no idea. And so they start putting everything together until we start exploring. They have these memories back, you know, since way back in childhood. And it's not until we start exploring and and going through the regressions, but they do have conscious memory. No one ever comes to me with a completely blank mind and and tells me, I want to know if I was abducted. Well, I I can't work with someone like that because then I feel like, okay, is this person a wannabe or, you know, I, I explore their background. I send out a questionnaire, explore their background, ask them about their um you know, their, their families, their, the mother, the father, have, have they talked about um, anything high strangeness, I call it, because it is a family affair. So, you know, it, it's, it's very complicated, and uh, it frustrates me when I hear these skeptics and debunkers, you know, just spouting, um, spouting out their own theories, and all these people are, you know, they're, they're all dreaming, they're all wannabes. They have, I heard somebody not too long ago, psychologists say these people can't hold down jobs. And that struck me. I, I actually got angry because that is totally untrue. I have professional people. I mean, like I said, people from all walks of life, but people like doctors and lawyers and firemen, you know, and commercial airline pilots. You can't, you can't tell me they can't hold down a job. You know, I, I, I think one of the interesting things are, is about triggers, uh, the kinds of things that, you, as you mentioned and you mentioned in the book, uh, things that sort of trigger a memory. Suddenly somebody yes. somebody knows something is wrong. They're, they're afraid of something I- irrationally, like a, a me- metal instrument or something. Yes. And uh, they see a movie or, or something else triggers. For a lot of people, I noticed it popped up a couple of times in your book, and I've read this yes. before. It was the image on communion on the, on the cover oh, of yeah. Whitley Strieber's book. And when people saw that, wow, well, for a lot of them, it was, it was the trigger that made them remember something was going on. And that still happens. I've told Whitley about it. Um, that, that cover, I told him, has, has opened up so many doors for people. I mean, people actually will look at it and, and want to run away from it, and they didn't know why. Um, well, we're going to have Melinda later on in the show. She reacted the same way when she saw the cover. Um, but I get the I get people still saying, "Oh my God!" When I saw the the cover on Communion, it was like they a couple of them had said, "Well, they kind of look like that." And then all of a sudden, they realize, "Why did I say that? How do I know that? You know, where do I get this information?" But there are there are little triggers um, that that people will get um, that have caused them to have the PTSD. Um, and PTSD, as you know, you know, in, anybody who has suffered a trauma, and, and we compare it with uh, our military coming back from war. Or rape. But I've, I've also dealt with people who have had terrible car accidents where they can't get back in their car or they can't drive on a certain stretch of road or in that intersection where they were hit. And I work with them, you know, with the PTSD. And I've told my audiences that all the symptoms are the same, whether it's a terrible car accident 
or military coming back, and I've worked with some military, or alien abduction. These symptoms are all the same. They, these people have suffered a trauma, and the, and the subconscious job is to protect us from the trauma by blocking some of that memory. Yvonne, let's, uh, let's talk about Coronado and the events uh, on that weekend, uh, starting with a couple of the, the people you work with, your members, Alice and Lacey. They were roommates that weekend, right? Yes, they were, yes, and um, they were in, and there's pictures in the book, they were in the one um, very old hotel called the Village Inn. They were roommates, <laughs> and then down the hallway was Mike and his wife, and then on the opposite side, um, the other side of the hallway was uh, Jack and his wife. So there were six people in that hotel who all experienced something same night. And and did they have conscious memories of it? Alice is the one that was kind of just woke up in the morning and was kind of discombobulated, right? Oh, yeah. She woke up on the floor. She had um, her blanket, like a little spare blanket, wrapped around her neck. Um, Mike woke up um, with blood on his pillow, and I show that in the book. And um, let me see. Jack woke up, or he went, or he had memory of a um, bright light coming in, and then they all heard someone screaming in the hallway. Um, Alice and Lacey are rooming together. Neither one of them, when they work, wake up in the morning, though, remember being taken, right? And they just know something is kind of off. They know that something, right, yes, that something... Yes, there's a, there's a hint of of this with people that, especially with Alice, you know, um, winding up on the floor. I, I believe it's between her bed and the closet, with the blanket wrapped around her. And but she also felt, which is very very typical of these experiences, very ill, like flu like symptoms. Um, they they feel um, very. Sore. The, the expression often is, oh, I feel like I've been run over by a truck. I hear that all the time. I remember, I can't remember if there's these two ladies or, or they, they were part of the group, but a couple of the witnesses in the book uh, describe uh, encounters with what might be Secret Service agents or waiters. It's almost like a men in black kind of an encounter. Hey, it was yes. really weird when we were at dinner and those th- yes. three or four waiters are standing right there at, at the table in their dark suits. Well, I, I was at that dinner, and that, that's what I have the advantage of being there, you know, so I know what it was like. We were sitting in that beautiful dining room at the Del Coronado. It was after I regressed Lacey. I regressed her um, in my hotel room there at the Del Coronado, but not, you know, it was, it was on another experience, a missing time experience that she had. And um, we, the three of us, Alice and Lacey and I, went down to the dining room, and Lacey, uh, she needed a, a glass of wine, much-needed glass of wine, after that regression. And I remember that uh, there were about four, three or four waiters all standing around us, and almost as if, I think it was Alice saying, I feel like they're trying to hear our conversation. And it was a little strange because, you know, we looked around, Alice looked around, Lacey looked around. Lacey was getting a little nervous about it because she thought, you know, she was getting a bad feeling about it. And she, there was no one else at these other tables. And it wasn't totally crowded, but it wasn't empty either. Um, it, no one else had three or four waiters around their table. So um, that was a little strange. I mean, I did not have my UFO MC badge on at this time. This was on the Friday night um, before the conference started. The conference was going to start early Saturday morning. So could they have been Secret Service wondering, hey, should we keep an eye on these wacky UFO people? Well, that's what I suspected. I figured, well, sure, you know, sure, we're we're going to be wacky to them. And, you know, and, and what better way is to dress like a waiter and hover around the table. 
contrary to what you may have seen on the website earlier tonight, we are not addressing the Bell Witch in this program, though I'm sure Seth would be happy to answer questions about the Bell Witch. Uh, That's an earlier film of his, came out last year. Uh, The new movie looks at the epicenter of weirdness, the Appalachia, uh, possibly the oldest mountain range of the world, home to some of the strangest, oldest, oddest mysteries, a, a cornucopia of creatures, dark entities, spooky legends, mixed in with a heavy smattering of UFO incidents. Are all these different manifestations somehow related? And if so, how? Seth and his team collected eyewitness accounts and expert testimony from the people who populate the hills and hollows of West Virginia, which is where some of the strangest entities were first reported, including Mothman, the Men in Black, the Flatwoods Monster, and others, all while the same area has been among the hottest of UFO hotspots. Filmmaker Seth Breedlove and his company, Small Town Monsters, have explored the backwoods of coal country for six film projects, including the latest, On the Trail of UFOs, Dark Sky, which looks at possible intersections of things seen in the sky and beings seen on the ground. Seth, welcome back to Coast. Hey, George. Thanks so much for having me. You know, I think what I appreciate about your films is that you have such a broad focus in your approach. You know, I suspect you have a target, you know, what your the film is going to be about when you go into an area, but then you end up collecting so much more along the way. Sometimes I think you incorporate them into the films of the moment, and then sometimes you seem to stash them for the future. True? Uh, definitely, yeah, yeah. And I don't know, I, you might understand this, actually, um, being a journalist, but I, I did newspaper reporting before I did filmmaking, and I find that the way in which I, I direct a movie, a documentary, or edit a documentary is, is similar to how I did my stories, where the... The, the the film itself is sort of directed by the flow of what the people we're interviewing are, are telling me, and so they're they're kind of guiding the actual story that we end up telling. And and with a film like this, that's really important because we're able to pick at different threads and follow them and let the the story basically tell itself. And with a you know with something as sprawling as this, uh, that's really important because we we had 16 different people, you know, telling their individual eyewitness stories and, and sort of guiding the, the flow of the film in that way. Yeah, I did the same thing in, in news stories. I always gather more information than I can ever possibly use for an individual piece, uh, but you yeah. stash it away for future projects, you know, and uh, you, and those sound bites, the interviews are always the building blocks of what, what goes on the air. And, and you make great use of the interviews. They're, the, the characters that you speak to, the their sincerity comes across. Uh, real people, you know, it's great storytelling technique. It's a it 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 is a weird thing. The film, in some ways, is a response to the current state of of ufological entertainment, or you you know whatever you want to call it, ufological journalism, whatever you want to call it. I I've just noticed in the last couple of years that there's a shift in focus away from the 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 regular people, the the witnesses, the experiencers, whatever you want to call it. And and in some cases it's needed and it's good. Um, you know, obviously when you're looking at the military angle and all that kind of stuff, that stuff's very important. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's it's normal people that are experiencing these things and people that just live out in the, the country somewhere in rural, in rural communities tend to be, you know, the bulk of, of witnesses. And um, that the film really purposefully, very purposefully, focused on those people and their experiences. And and uh, I that's something that I've always been drawn to when it comes to ufology and um, really any paranormal topic. It's just the witnesses and what, what they're encountering. I, I joked the last time we spoke that if, uh, you know, if Joe Manchin ever leaves the U.S. Senate, you might be able to run for office in West Virginia. You've been all over that state, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, just uh, actually, just since we talked, we were filming there again. So it's uh, it's an unending uh, trip trip back to the mountain state for me. I, I feel like I'm there almost every week, and eventually we need to set up like a, a satellite small town monsters headquarters in the mountain state somewhere. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, the the thing is that, that they've got a long history of this kind of weirdness, and and when it comes to UFOs, I think maybe that gets overlooked. You know, for some of the southwest desert states or, you know, maybe even New England or something like that, people kind of forget about West Virginia and its ties to, 
you know, UFOs and the paranormal in general. But I mean, they, they've they've been at the th- in the thick of things going back to like 1952 when the Flatwoods monster case happened and that kind of stuff. So, to me, it's a no-brainer to to make this movie, and we had wanted to make this movie since we made uh, our first Mothman movie because that movie's that story, the Mothman story, is so tied into UFOs and UFO lore and things like the Men in Black and Indrid Cold. And we had covered some of those things in some small amount of detail, but we weren't able to really dig into it in that movie. And so we had been, it's like you said, you know, we had been stockpiling these stories that we wanted to tell in the history of UFOs in that state. We've been keeping that in our back pocket, knowing that eventually we would get to that story. And uh, it, it just happened to be this this movie on the trail of UFOs. Dark well, Sky. Let's, let's talk about why West Virginia, why Appalachia. Why such a concentration of so much weirdness? I mean, you could see the critics or skeptics saying that people there must have vivid imaginations or they might joke, well, these are all country bumpkins. Um, You know, why don't UFOs appear over major cities, which, of course, they do. I I can hear the knives being sharpened now to go after your witnesses. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and... and it, it, it came up almost immediately in the earliest reviews for the movie. The uh, you know that there's too much moon moon sign in the backwoods of West Virginia and those, those kind of jokes. Um, but you know, I, f- I find that the people we interviewed uh, and and just in general, the people I talk to when I go to West Virginia tend to be normal folk, uh, very kind people, and and not exactly the stereotype of what what pop culture kind of tells us that West Virginia is. Um, now, why that state in particular, that's one of the big questions we're asking throughout the movie. And, you know, like with any of any of the projects I make, we're, we're putting the information out there and letting the audience make up their own minds as to what they think is going on. Um, so, so throughout the film, one of the, you know, one of the most frequently recited reasons why there might be so many UFOs seen in the skies of West Virginia is that it, it's a dark sky state. I mean, it's, you know, and what that means is that there are more places in that state where you can actually see like the Milky Way, where you can get a really good, uh, you know, almost a zero light pollution look at, at the sky. Um, there's numerous places like that in that state because there aren't a lot of big cities. The biggest city in the state is Charleston, and it's not a massive city by any stretch of the, the imagination. Um, it's a it's a place where there are not a lot of people. You get back into the hills, and there just aren't people living there. So there's a, there's there's almost zero light pollution. Uh, but the, but there's darker reasons why that m- might be the case as well. There's there's theories that there are numerous hidden government installations around the the state of West Virginia. Um, and, and that's not entirely, you know, conspiracy theory. We, we know that, that Greenbrier, the, the massive resort had a bunker that was hidden under it where uh, the president and his cabinet could retreat to in the case of like a nuclear attack or something like that. We know that that existed there. There's rumors that all throughout the, uh, the you know, the mountains that there's these hidden underground bases around the state of West Virginia. That actually holds true for most of Appalachia. You go down to North Carolina um, and around Brown Mountain, there's rumors that are similar to that, that there's a secret government installation in the mountains down there. Um, There's there's all sorts of strange encounters that have happened um, between ordinary people and shadowy military personnel in the woods. Uh, you, You can throw a rock in that state and you'll find someone who has a story about seeing a, a battalion of of unmarked military vehicles go by and and I've even talked to people from that state who claim that they encountered Russian military uh, training in the in the mountains there. So there's all sorts of like weird shadowy military stories. Uh, beyond that you have these numerous sightings that correlate to energy sources. Um, there's, there's, uh, a place in West Virginia called known as the, the chemical Valley. It's, um, you know, it's, it's like a stretch of land. It's actually not that far from like Point Pleasant. It's a very industrialized section of the state. And in that area, there were numerous sightings from the, 
the 70s all the way through the 80s and I guess up to present day as well of these UFOs seen near these, uh, you know, these various power plants. And one of the interesting theories that comes up in the movie is that, you know, you might not be able to, to necessarily say these are nuclear power plants, but if you combined the various components being created at each of the plants, you could potentially create, you know, some sort of nuclear energy, um, which is super fascinating. But beyond that, there's also the, the fact that so many of the sightings are taking place near coal mines or mines of some sort that are dotting that state. Um, and, and that's not even getting into some of the, the more outlandish, you know, reasons why UFOs might be seen. But the one thing to, to say is that this isn't a new phenomenon. UFOs in West Virginia goes back as far as UFOs have been seen in, in the United States and reported on. Um, but especially starting in 1952 with Flatwoods Monster Case up to present day, you know, the, the sightings don't even, I, I would hesitate to say that they wax and wane. I think it's a pretty steady stream of reports that come in regarding UFOs. It's just, to me, it seems like it's very overlooked by the UFO community. It's, it's sort of underreported on. Uh, it, it, tell me about that. So is there a central mechanism for collecting those reports in West Virginia, or is it difficult to get uh, rural people to open up and, and share that information with anyone? I, I think it's difficult for organizations to get their hands on reports from that state. So, so MUFON is obviously based in West Virginia. They have a, not based in, but they have a, a branch in West Virginia. Um, but I would reckon that Folks like Les O'Dell, who lives there and is featured in our movie, he runs a, a, a local West Virginia-based paranormal research group. I think people like him or Ron Lanham and Joe Purdue, who run Wild and Weird West Virginia, because they're based in that state, I think locals are probably more willing to talk to those guys because they're, t- they're talking to people that live there, that understand them, that aren't going to, you know, maybe denigrate what they're saying or, or, or detract and, and try to make them, you know, I, I guess that at the end of the day, people don't necessarily want to report something to someone and immediately have that person try to debunk it. And while I understand the importance of that, and I'm all for the importance of debunking and, and trying to get to the bottom of what's going on, in a state like West Virginia, those people are going to balk at that almost immediately because they, they're not expecting to be taken seriously to begin with. So, so talking to someone like Les or Ron and Joe, um, you know, or any of the, the local investigators in in the '80s, it was a guy named Bob Teets, and Bob wrote a, a book, I think called Mountain State UFOs in the Mountain State or something to that effect. That book is the book that we really drew off of um, in terms of case files t- to find because he he was based there. He spoke to people there in terms of like UFO knowledge about West Virginia, Bob seems to have been the guy. Um, and, and it's sad because you don't hear this guy's name anymore. I, I had never heard his name before. He found this book, but Bob really did a great job of compiling, you know, UFO stories. I mean, obviously you also have guys like Gray Barker and John Keel did a lot of work in, in the state of West Virginia. So what it, what it comes down to is I just don't think that the people that live in that state necessarily want to report things to like a, a national UFO, you know, report reporting branch or anything like that, move on. I'm sure they do, but I, I think more than likely the really solid stuff is coming to the locals. Yeah, I can understand that. I, you know, there's a presumption I lived in the South for a couple of years, so I do not uh, assume, as uh, some people do, that anyone with a drawl or an accent is some kind of a bumpkin. You know, uh, you know that is right. simply un- an unfair stereotype and inaccurate. Um, but I'm sure that they've had that experience when they share a story about something they've seen. They get ridiculed on the basis of that stereotype. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and and even even when I go there to make a movie, we rely on some of those friends of ours that are based in that state to to set the stage for us, to introduce us, to get us in the door. Because you know we come in there with our Ohio non accents, and <laughs> well, aren't you fancy? To, yeah, yeah. So, the, uh, we're just talking to the locals, and and they don't know what to expect of us either. But if you can, you can either have someone 
who's based there to introduce you, or you can show them our track record of the movies we've made, and, and maybe that'll help you out as well. But you know, it, it's a it's a people are standoffish, but they're not rude about it. We've been to places where people are rude about it. They just in in the state of West Virginia, they're they're a little hesitant to to really open up about what's happened to them until you can get your foot in the door. Among the rich stories from Appalachia, uh, the Flatwoods Monster case from 1952. Seth, bring us up to date on that for those not familiar with that case, why it's a classic. Yeah, gladly. And and this was one of those stories that we knew there were other angles to, but we didn't have the opportunity to cover them in our initial you know movie we actually made a movie in 2018 about the flatwoods monster and weirdly enough every time we're we're located i'm located in a town called wadsworth ohio i've had multiple people in this area come up to me at events and tell me that they had some connection to that case so it's it's a case that that there's a lot more to it than what's been put out over the years and what's been put out over the years isn't necessarily accurate either so um yeah 1952 uh august, september actually september 12 1952 there was a, a string of ufo sightings across the united states particularly the eastern seaboard uh heading all the way down to alabama um one of these mysterious objects that were seen in the sky was uh, seen flying over the town, or I guess you'd call it a village of Flatwoods, West Virginia, which is smack dab in the middle of the state of West Virginia. It is, it is almost exactly the geographic center of the state. Um, these kids are playing football on a field. Uh, Eddie May, Freddie May, Tommy Heyer, and uh, one other whose name escapes me, but um, they see this object go overhead and and comes to kind of a controlled stop or controlled landing on top of a hill. Um, They rush up the uh, road to the top of the hill, and along the way they stop at Ed and Fred May's house and get uh, Mrs. May, Kathleen May, and another boy, uh, Gene Lemon, who was actually a National Guardsman at the time. Uh, They also get their dog. They head up to the top of the hill. And um, and some of this is uh, just simply the version of the story that exists. I, I don't necessarily believe that that what what took place has been recounted properly over the years, and might not have been until our movie came out. But they go up the hill, and according to legend, they encounter a, a glowing object on top of the hill, a, a downed UFO. Um, they supposedly approach the UFO. There was a string of mist in the air. Um, you know, according to legend, they all became really sick. Uh, there was vomiting and retching and all that kind of stuff. The dog took off running down the hill, and according to legend, again, the dog died. Now, the, the reality is that dog never died, and also that there was probably no UFO immediately seen. They definitely saw something down in the forest, but probably not a UFO up close. But they, um, they had a little further up the hill, and uh, near the forest, near a forest, um, right, right next to this tree emerges this 13 foot tall um, object, um, and it's kind of become known as a creature over the years. But it's just this strange, massive uh, creature with what looks like an ace of spades for a head. Um, it's it's shaped kind of like a, a rocket. Um, Ed May would later say it was shaped like a. a what, like a B-12 or B-2 rocket, something like that. Um, the, the creature seemed to hover in the air and come toward them, and uh, they all took off running back down the hill and called the police. The police phoned it into the National Guard, and, and before you know it, the National Guard comes out to investigate the scene. Um, and, you know, for a lot of people, that's where the story ends. But the fact is that there were other sightings of creatures similar to the Flatwoods Monster. There was a, a sighting that took place uh, maybe just a few days prior near the town of Heaters by a young girl, uh, two young girls actually, who, who claimed to have encountered the same creature. Um, and then there was a, sight, a sighting the very next day uh, by a name, a man named George Smithowski, who was driving on a back road late at night and uh, suffered some sort of strange engine failure. And uh, while he was checking the, the engine, uh, he heard a, a weird noise, turned around, and saw basically the 
the same thing, the flatless monster coming right toward him. Now, also around the same time, were sightings in in Wheeling, West Virginia, of what the local media dubbed uh, "Bashful Billy," which is one of the one of the more West Virginia names uh, you're going to hear given to a, a monster. But um, it's the same same sort of description: thirteen foot tall. Um, the media said it, you know, it, it breathed fire and was this Frankenstein-looking creature, which is also what they said about uh, the Flatwoods monster itself, the green monster. Um, and all these sightings are within just a few days of each other, um, all within, you know, maybe two, two, three hours of each other, and all accompanying this massive UFO wave that sweeps down the uh, the eastern seaboard. One other thing that's interesting about this is, you know, Today, Flatwoods is sort of known as, I mean, this is what they're known for. This is what Flatwoods and the town of Sutton, West Virginia are known for. And they've capitalized on it uh, through through a small Flatwoods Monster Museum and uh, an event that they do on uh, September 12th called Braxy Bazaar, which I'll actually be at. So it's, a, it's kind of a cool, they, they've they've used it, you know, to, to uh, I guess, assist the tourism in the town. It's a really cool town, too. Uh, other than eyewitness accounts, is there anything else to substantiate it? Did the National Guard find tracks or physical evidence of some sort where this thing supposedly crashed or where the creature was seen hovering? So they they found tracks. Later, they, they the, the tracks were debunked as being one of the tractors that had actually driven up the hill to, to try to find the Flatwoods monster. Um, they, they've definitely corroborated that this was an event that happened, that they went and investigated but what was seen and what was there, according to them, there was there was really no material left behind um, following their investigation. Now, you know, if, this could be a Kecksburg incident. You know, maybe they ran off with it and put it in Wright Patterson, like like Kecksburg or Roswell. Who knows? But according to to the National Guardsmen that, that were there, there was nothing left at the scene. There was an oil slick, again blamed on a tractor or a truck that had driven up up the hill to actually try to find the Flatwoods monster. But, you know, there was a detailed uh, examination of the scene, certainly by the National Guard. So they took it seriously enough that they sent a, a, a pretty decent regiment of, of men up to the top of this hill in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia, uh, to look into it. So that, that itself kind of tells you something about the case. I mean, you know, something that large, with a head shaped like an ace of spades and it's hovering coming toward the witnesses. And then it gets a nickname bashful Billy. It seems like something that would be easy to debunk or diminish at least because it sounds so preposterous, but that's what the witnesses saw. Yeah, that's what they claim to have seen. And and bashful Billy, the bashful Billy case is super interesting because it takes place in a lower income housing area, part of wheeling. And, there was apparently at the time just an unwillingness by the police to even go there. So when that report was called in, when, when people called in the reports of seeing this creature, this 13-foot-tall you know, uh, metallic creature wandering around, the police didn't even want to go investigate. What's interesting about that, though, is that supposedly there was a, a police officer who was attacked by this thing and burned um, – that was in the one of the initial reports that was in the newspaper. However, we, we can't really find any evidence that actually took place, that a police officer was burned. It's just part of that initial newspaper story. And unfortunately, at that point in time, it's just hard to tell what's fact and what's fiction. So this happens. Flatwood Monster is seen, multiple witnesses, different locations, September 1952, during a big UFO wave. So is that creature right. from the UFO? Is that what we think? I mean, that's... That's part of the theory, obviously, that people work with. Um, you know, I mean, the, the fact is that Ed May and Fred May they were two of the witnesses, and, and they're the ones we have to go off of what they're saying because they're the only remaining living witnesses that we can talk to. What they claim they encountered wasn't a creature um, as detailed by the newspaper reports or even Gray Barker and Ivan Sanderson, who were two of the first people to investigate the case. They claim what they saw was, was basically some sort of experimental rocket that hovered slightly off the ground that had two portholes, not eyes, two portholes that had light spilling out of them. Their impression was that there was something or somebody inside that rocket that was actually controlling it. Um, and, and if you talk to either of them, their 
opinion on whether or not this was alien can change on any given day. I know Ed May believes that what he encountered was an experimental prototype rocket that was probably put there by the U.S. military. Um, but the fact that there was this string of UFO sightings uh, across the seaboard is definitely going to raise red flags. And, and there was actually a second object that crashed that night. The one in Flatwoods wasn't the only one that was said to crash. There was a report that came in to the local sheriff of an um, airplane going down over the Elk River right outside of Sutton. And, in fact, when Kathleen May went called the police after encountering the Flatwoods monster, the police were not in the office at the time because they were investigating this supposed down aircraft. There was no aircraft ever found, but there were reports all over the area of people seeing something streak across the sky and crash into the top of the hill near the Elk River, and that's just a second crash, you know, that, that coincides with the Flatwoods event. Uh, you start your film uh, on the trail of UFOs, Dark Sky. It starts with a pretty good UFO case that most of the world never heard of. I had never heard of it before. This big red diamond that was hovering around uh, power lines, which, again, sort of fits in with your theme about how often they are seen in, in connection with power uh, facilities. Talk about that. Tell us about that story, what you learned. Yeah, this this is such a great story, and again, I think this is one of the ones that we pulled from from Bob Teat's book. Um, again, I can't stress enough that that is a very important document that that really catalogs a lot of West Virginia's weird history, and it's one that I think is overlooked. But uh, the the witness's name was Ke- Kenneth Shaw, and Kenneth was great. Um, Shannon did just an, an amazing job of talking to him and really getting the details of the case. But basically, in the 1980s. Um, during dinner one night, uh, you know, he's there, his whole family is there, he's got cousins and uncles there. Um, they, one of them sees this bizarre object appear in the sky over a uh, power line. Um, they rush outside to see it, multiple members of the family see this, this object. It's, uh, it's shaped like, like you said, like a diamond. Um, if you're aware of, of the Cash Landrum encounter that took place in Texas, it sounds like an object that might have been somewhat similar to that. It's got a, he, he describes there being a pulsing red center to this thing. It hovers over the power lines. It seems to be leaching some sort of energy off the power lines. And then it goes away. And then what happens is over the remainder of this week, the object returns multiple times, always around the same time. Um, it's in the evening. It it makes its appearance. It's not trying to stay hidden. Um, Kenneth's mother saw it five times. He sees it three times. Uh, on one of the occasions when it appears over the power lines, a neighbor actually comes out and fires a shot at this thing, um, connects with it, and these sparks, or as, as he described them, almost like tiny orbs fly off of the... Um, off of this craft and and take off into the woods. And what's interesting is they still see these orbs in the woods today. People around the area still report seeing these strange glowing balls of light moving moving through the woods at night, which is just a really weird detail. But, um, you know, they, they see this thing multiple times over the course of the week, always in the same spot, always doing the same thing, seemingly leaching power or, or some sort of energy off the power lines. And then it, it all kind of culminates late in the week, Kenneth's up in the woods behind his house, and he encounters a hazmatted, what he says is a hazmat-suited individual um, that he's not sure if it was a human being or not because it's in this uniform. Um, that he describes as a hazmat, and he actually had a BB gun on him at the time. So as you would do as a as a kid, he he points the BB gun at this thing and fires some shots at it. Um, it seems to remain completely unfazed, and the thing leaves. And uh, after one week, the sightings stop. And you know, obviously tying into the energy sources and the power lines, but but also interestingly enough is that, you know, there's a mine, a, a massive coal mine right on the other side of that hill as well. So there, it kind of connects to some of the various threads that we're, we're pulling at in the movie, but it's a really weird case and it involves multiple, you know, multiple 
uh, corroborating witnesses. And, you know, Kenneth was affected by this in a pretty major way. He actually moved away when he got older and kind of swore he'd never go back to that road again. And uh, thankfully, we managed to get him there to to conduct the interview. And it's a really, really interesting interview and and had a a pretty big effect on him, I think, as a a person, and as it would, I guess, if you encountered something like that. So this incident of uh, people just grabbing a gun and taking a pot shot at things they don't know what it is, uh, whether it's a UFO or a strange uh, man in a hazmat suit, that pops up again and again, doesn't it? Well, yeah, and not just in West Virginia. I mean, you've, you've got the Kelly Hopkinsville Goblin case from 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 uh, the town of Kelly, Kentucky. Um, but yeah, that's that's a pretty common theme um, throughout. You know, I, I would assume much of the United States is that when people encounter something they don't know, you're going to react. You know, one of maybe like two or three ways, and and one of those is to to get defensive or offensive and and start shooting at the thing. I mean. It's interesting because we're preparing for this uh, the cattle mutilation movie we're making, and one of the things I keep coming across are, are reports of ranchers firing shots at black helicopters or helicopters in general, <laughs> yes. yep. um, you know, that are flying over those ranch their ranches. In a lot of cases, it, it was nothing. It was like a a military helicopter or something. But because they were so on edge from the things they were experiencing, they would they would fire shots at at those those vehicles. Um, so it is, yeah, it's a pretty common. <laughs> pretty common occurrence to to get on the offensive. Well, so far, uh, none of these uh, gunshots have uh, sparked an interstellar war or, a, you know, an, an interdimensional uh, invasion. Uh, but, Not that yeah, we're it's aware interesting. of. Yeah. Uh, I, I mentioned before about Shannon as being your secret weapon. Shannon the Grow, who uh, lives here in Las Vegas, she's been our guest on this show, and I've interviewed her for uh, Mystery Wire and... Um, uh, she's she does a great job of uh, sort of breaking the ice with witnesses who may not otherwise want to speak to you. Yeah, she's she's amazing, and she's she's once you get into the interview, she's she's the one that guides the uh, the witness and, and leads you know what what is going to actually come out and has to take the reins and and kind of make sure that 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 witness feels at ease, which again is something you're probably very familiar with. But I mean that's probably the biggest part of her job is trying to make sure that people are at ease and are able to, to, you know, reconstruct the events in their mind and, and tell us the, the event in their own words. And Shannon has always been amazing at, at doing that. And Shannon herself refers to herself as a, a collector of stories. Um, and the first time I heard that, I thought that was such a unique way of putting it because it's, she doesn't brand herself as a paranormal investigator or a U- UFO expert or a ufologist or any of that. She she just collects stories, and um, you know, trying to to maybe start piecing together some of the connecting threads of those stories, the tissue of those stories, is something we've just started to do. But I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is that she's able to collect those stories at all, because in a lot of these cases, these are not people who want to. Right. talk about these experiences and kenneth is like the perfect example of that like you know kenneth took us back to the location where he had seen this diamond-shaped craft but he had he wasn't interested really in telling his story um they don't a witness doesn't gain anything by doing that you know very often you hear uh other chasing fame and fortune there's no fame and fortune in a ufo in, in a completely independent ufo documentary production no. right no um no. you know we're not we're not paying this guy a million dollars to be in the movie so he has nothing to gain by being involved in it um and he was just uh, willing to tell a story because shannon was was so good at getting it out of him seth breedlove the new movie is called on the trail of ufos dark sky My guest, uh, Mike Cleland, has written The Messengers and stories from The Messengers about owls, synchronicity, uh, how owls seem to be in the proximity with the alien abduction type experiences, missing time, other strange experiences as well. We're going to hear some of those stories. And then at the bottom of this hour, we open up the phone lines with your calls and questions and hopefully some of your own experiences uh, with owls. So, Mike, you've collected hundreds of stories. Hit me with some of them. Uh, hit me with some of the examples of uh, kinds of things that, for example, you, you write in uh, uh, that people read the first book and they react. It triggers memories. What are the kinds of memories that it triggers? What are the experiences that you've heard? Um, you know, it's, so they'll remember owl stories 
in in particular. Well, here's a simple one from from uh, this is a fellow who was almost in conjunction with reading my book. That um, or I guess he was he was. So I got a hold of this guy named Ben, and him and I have become close friends. And he's had he's one of these maybe people. I'm very cautious to put him in a category, but let me tell you, if he tells you stories, they sound like the kind of stories a UFO experiencer would tell. Uh, he was with his kids, and um, they were at a, a roller skating party, and all the kids were coming home in the van. And he said, you know, like this was the night I was going to talk about. They, they, all the kids in the van were said like, Dad, Dad, tell a story. And so he said, I'm going to tell them about these UFO experiences. And he told a handful of these bizarre stories to these kids in this van, and they were all really into it. And he, and at the end, the last story culminated with a missing time experience. And when he told the story, right when he finished the story, right at the moment of finishing the story, an owl flew past the windshield. And so it was like this instantaneous moment. Finish the story, owl flies past the windshield. Uh, later, he takes the kids on a hike, his, his own kids, and they walk down this path. And they're in the woods, and they're walking down this path, and there's an owl that flies and follows them. It goes from one to tree to the other, and it follows them along. And he, the kids love it. He's kind of freaked out. So that night, the kids are very young. And that night, the kids, the, he says, okay, I'll pick a, pick a book. I'll come up and read to you. So they pick a book called Say Boo. It's about a ghost that cannot say the word boo. So so he, the, the, the ghost can't scare anyone because it can't say boo. So it's getting close to Halloween. And, and, and the ghost is all upset because he can't scare anyone. So he goes to the cow. And instead of saying boo, he says moo. And it, so he eventually meets an owl, and and he can't say boo, but he can say who. So as he's reading this, the ghost is named Ben, and my friend's name is Ben. He's reading the book, and he gets he reads the line aloud. Then Ben looked up into a tall pine tree and saw an owl, and the dog downstairs starts barking. So he runs downstairs, and he he opens the door. There's nothing out there. He looks up in the tree, and there's an owl in the tree. And he is convinced, or feels strongly, let's say, he feels strongly that was the same owl that had followed them down the path that day. So, you know, I write this story up, and it, 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 he's a, he was super helpful. So he's doing these kind of things. I really want it to be accurate. So I, I go back and forth and back and forth with documents over email and, and say, okay, I want this to be, I want it to be correct because I, I, it's your story, not mine. And, and he's correcting the text, and he goes, you know what? These are the same stories. This is two stories of mine, right? So the story where I'm in the car telling the story, I'm finding my voice. The first time I ever tell that story is to my kids. I'm finding my voice. And the second story is this children's book. And there's a powerful synchronicity about this children's book where this ghost is trying to find his voice. And then I see the owl out the back door. Now, this was this happened in conjunction with writing the present book. And I have found that a lot where, where there was, I'm not quite answering your question directly. I'm sort of in a way indirectly answering the same question um, where people where the act of working on these stories with the people. They will often go from maybe people to saying, you know, I feel strongly that I have had some sort of UFO contact. So, uh, these, the, the, I'm convinced the act of writing has some sort of power to it. The creative process of writing, putting things in a book, talking aloud on a podcast. I have had so many people. There's one fellow in the new book who was driving in his car, coming home from work. He crossed a bridge. An owl flew right in front of his windshield and scared him. Full daylight. Whoa, he like, it really shocked him. Big owl flies right in front of his windshield. He drives about a half a mile further, and there's a big UFO hovering alongside of the highway. He was in traffic. He had to just keep on moving, and he lost sight of it. Um, now, he was listening to my voice. On a, a, He had taken a lecture that I had given that's on YouTube and downloaded it and was listening to that lecture. So this blew my mind where, where he was listening to my story about owls and UFOs as he saw an owl and a UFO. And I have no <laughs> idea what to make of that. The power of that synchronicity is just so, the knot is just tied so tight, I can't untangle it. 
You have several, uh, at least a few instances where people describe owls that are impossibly large, right? And they're not really thinking anything of it. Uh, there's a four foot tall owl. That is Am very I... common. Yes, that's very yeah. common. Yeah, and what did the, usually in the context is, is alongside the road. I have an amazing. So the the typical story is, uh, and then uh, uh, drive someone's driving down the road, and I have a story of this where a fellow um, told me this story. It was funny. He told it at a UFO experiencer support group, and he uh, he was at the group, and everyone in the group, and Leo Sprinkle was leading this. That was a man I have a huge respect for. Was leading this group. At, uh, at the conference when they used to be held in Laughlin, Nevada. And um, he's off in the corner, didn't say anything. Right at the end of the meeting, he kind of raises his hand and says, has anyone in the room here had any odd experiences with owls? And <laughs> I mean, he must—he almost fell out of his chair when everyone in the room raised their hand, including me. And then he told the story where he said, I was driving down the road at night and there was a four foot tall owl on the side of the road. And I pulled right up next to it. And I rolled my window down. And I looked at it, and I got this really bad feeling, like I wasn't supposed to be there. So I got in the car. I just, you know, hit the gas and drove away. Late, he's a photographer, and he he went and took pictures of some owls in a nest in the woods. I'm mean, I told him about this nest in the woods, and he takes these pictures of owls. And it, as he's taking the pictures, he's like, "I don't think that was an owl I saw that night." So he, so he goes to he actually goes and gets hypnotic regression. Very little comes up out of the hypno, his hypnosis session, except the owl was wearing boots. <laughs> so here we have again this this blurring, you know, like some something. It's because there's no owl on Earth that is four foot tall. There's big owl is a two foot tall owl is a huge owl. Um, so it, it, a four foot tall owl is simply impossible, can't exist. Um, so- and I have, and I, I actually had to like, I mean, I could have told, I could have filled three volumes of books just in stories of four foot tall owls. Uh, it would have got a little repetitive at a certain point. So I just, you know, I could only, there's only so much you can say when you hear the same story over and over again. The, um, this guy went as far as to have hypnotic regression. Have you considered it for yourself? I have attempted it four times. Um, and then uh, I had some interesting stuff show up. Though very little that um, uh, that like it feels like it confirmed anything for me. So I yeah I had a hypnosis session with Bud Hopkins when he was still alive, and uh, and just recently I had a hypnosis session with Mary Rodwell. Um, in the new book, in I, book yeah. one, uh, you have several uh, examples where it is transformative. The experience really does change people in dramatic ways. They're different after the encounter. The The owls are part of the encounter. Uh, there's other stuff that's going on, obviously, but a lot of things happen to them. Some they can remember, some they can't, but they are different people afterward. Uh, Susan McLeod is one of the examples in the new book. What happened to her? Oh, my gosh, that's a great story. There's, it's funny because this is really, there's a, she, this is a, she told an amazing story, and at the end of the story, like I got a hold of her, and said, um, "And she is she has owl totem poles all around her house. She's part she has Native American heritage or a First Nation heritage. She lives in Canada, and um, so she has seen a lot of owls. At the time of this event, there were owls all around her house, and she has had other experiences. So she had an amazing experience where she um, her she had a friend that died." And she has a teepee in her in her in her uh, place in Ontario, off in the woods. So she walks down the path from her house to the teepee, and it's at nighttime. And she builds a fire and burns sage and pounds a drum. And she's having a ceremony, a ritual ceremony, which I think is important. Like what was going on leading up to this experience? She was performing a ceremony, and she's in this teepee, and she feels something brush against the teepee, and it's big. And she's like, "Oh my gosh, is there a bear out there?" So she opens the teepee window, or the steps out, and there's a family, or she says it's a family, she calls a family of five Sasquatch, standing, boom, right there, outside the teepee. She runs back in, she beats the drum some more, she really beats it loud, she's kind of freaked out, and then she peeks out again, and they seem to be gone. So she runs really quickly back up to the house, and she sees them down further away. And she gets the distinct feeling that they moved, this family of five. She said they were standing like, like, a, like a corny family portrait, with the two adults in the back and three small ones in the front big hairy Sasquatch. Now she runs into the house to tell her kids and the kids are all freaked out. Mom, mom, there's something in the house. And there's black shadow beings that are zipping around the house. 
and she burns some sage and she has she's got she comes from a tradition of of healers and 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 uh and so she and then she goes to wants to tell her husband who's in the uh garage it's his wood shop and he has and so she goes to run and she knocks on the door and she, the door's locked he can't, she can't get in he's actually barricaded the door so no one can get in and she gets in and she says what's going on and so he says what's going on what is it? and he's seeing the same black shadow figures he's terrified there's they're zipping in and out of the, the garage. They're peeking in the windows. She says, "Oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta step away and just figure out what's going on." So she steps aside and she, she, she literally says, "I asked God, what does this mean?" And a triangle-shaped UFO hovers above her in the night sky. It just passes over above her, just barely above the trees. Her husband saw it too. Actually, it was her, it was her partner at the time. They weren't married. Um, and. She says something unusual. It was like flitting in and out of like reality. It wasn't like a solid structure. It was like kind of a hologram of a of a triangle craft. This at a time when she was seeing all kinds of owls, and she has amazing, beautiful owl stories uh, that associate with death. That that where she, um, I think there's these people who have kind of a like a magnetism for for these kind of paranormal experiences, and she's certainly one of them. So. You know, the question I had asked her is like, what was going on in your life or at this time? She said, I was seeing owls all the time when this event took place. So that 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 story goes way beyond just, uh, you know, uh, a UFO sighting that you could write down and, and fill out the little form when the MUFON investigator shows up. So much weird stuff is going on there. And this woman, as part of all these paranormal experiences, had and she also had a near death experience as a little child, so she's now working as a psychic, and um, and I've had many hours of conversations with her. She's an amazing, warm-hearted, radiant person, and uh, yes, yeah, so, so her life has been transformed by these uh, experiences. And she says one of the more powerful experiences she ever had was a visionary dream. And coming from a native tradition, she interpreted this dream within the framework of her culture, which is the Mi'kmaq tribe of, of Ontario and the Northeast, um, where she rode on the back of an owl. And she said she felt such love that it changed the direction of her life. So that's a really beautiful story. I'm really proud that in, of that story and really felt honored that she would let me tell it the, in, in, the, in the book. You have another connection, a near-death experience kind of connection that you mentioned in the second book, the newest book, uh, a lady named Denise Lynn. Oh, that's remember a, that? Yes, Denise Lynn. She's she's a working psychic. She's a working. Um, uh, she does uh, books on animal totems, and she does uh, books on healing, and 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 does psychic work and Reiki work, and and she. So here's this this connection again. This and so this is something that shows up in both books, but much more in the second book. This connection with the near death experience when she was 17 years old, 16 years old, I think. In the summer of 1967, the summer of love, she was shot and killed. She was riding a motorbike along the road. Someone came up alongside her, rammed her off the road, and then got, you know, opened, rolled his window down and shot and killed her. She was dead when she arrived at the hospital. And she came out of it. She, she has the experience of crossing a river. She said it was this magical, glowing river. I just, I knew that if I crossed it, I would, I would no longer be in the world of the physical. And it's a beautiful telling of how she describes it. And she she heard a voice that said, you have to go back. And she was like, no, I don't want to go back. And, and she felt like a lasso, a cord had pulled her back. And then she was back in her body. And, and uh, she then went on it, 10 years later, summer of 77, with her husband to... Um, they were fishing in Northern California and they were on their way back to San Francisco and she saw light in the sky. And she, she said, uh, like, what's this light? It's weird. Wait a minute. The light turned over there. Let's follow it. So the husband was like, what am I doing? And they drive, they drive the pickup truck down some lonely road and she's following this light. And they finally get to a point where he says, I'm not driving any farther. And she says, they get out of the car and they kind of have an argument. And then he sees it. He didn't have a very good view of it, but this light just, she said she telepathically in her mind said, if you're real, come, you come right here. And then whoosh, this thing just immediately, like a 50 foot wide flying saucer hovers directly above the trees right next to him. 
And she had a very strange reaction. She said, she yelled in her mind, I want to help people. I want to be of service to people. I want to be of service to people, which is a very unusual reaction. And she wrote about this in one of her books. And, and, uh, and I've talked to her at length about this. And so then, then uh, the thing eventually, an airplane comes by and, and this thing sort of senses it. She, that's her feeling. And whoosh, it's gone. And they, her and her husband get in a huge argument because he was, she said, we, get, we needed to follow that UFO. It flew away. We should have driven after it. And he's like, no way. That night, the next morning, actually, they had it. They conceived a child. They made love and had conceived a child. And that was very, their doctor said, you will never be able to have a child. She knew right away that she was pregnant. The doctor said, the severity of your gunshot wounds from 10 years earlier, 1967, and so now this child is born. So here we have a UFO sighting from someone who had a near-death experience, someone who screams at the UFO telepathically and says, I want to serve people. And then she has a child, which is when the doctor said she never could. It's a remarkable story. She goes into the woods one day to find her spirit animal name. She also has Native American heritage. And <clears throat> She says she walked into the woods. Her goal going into the woods was to find her spirit name, her true name. And and this is, the, again, what were you doing leading up to the event? She went with a intention. She sat down in the woods and closed her eyes and meditated. And um, when she opened her eyes, there was an owl on the branch right in front of her, like close enough to touch. She locked eyes with this owl, and this owl locked eyes with her. And they all flew off. She said she looked at it for maybe a minute. She said it felt like hours, but it was probably a minute. And there were three little feathers on the on the uh, branch. And she she heard in her mind said, "Put the owls in your medicine bag." She had a she had a Native American medicine bag, but it was at home. She's like, "I don't have my medicine bag with me." She said that aloud. And then the voice in her mind said, "You are your own medicine bag. Put." the owl feathers in your medicine bag. So she takes these three owl feathers and she eats them without even thinking. And then the voice says, you have taken on the power of the owl. And so that she said her spirit name from that point on was White Feather. And now in her travels, she's traveled all over the world. She's met with native leaders. She's met with shamans. She met with a fellow named Credo Mutua. Credo Mutua is a South African, I think he's a member of the Zulu tribe, He's a shaman, and he, when he met with her, he looked at her and said, oh, you have been with the sky people many times. He's like, what? She, and he shows him these traditional masks, these traditional Zulu masks that look like the cover of communion, big eyes, pointy chin. He said, you have been with them. You have been with the sky people. You have been abducted. She's like, uh, no way. I have not been abducted. He said she was she had been abducted many times, and she would, didn't want to. She didn't want to have anything to do with that. So she's, and I've talked to her. She's like, uh, uh-uh, I'm not going there. I've never been abducted. And from yes, that's I can't. But I mean, there's no way to, there's no way for me to say what may or may not have happened. But what I can say is, the, the, what she's sharing sounds like the kind of things that an abductee or an experiencer, let's say, or contactee would share. Someone this, she's now at, you know being of service to people. She's doing therapy work. She's doing psychic work. Um, the, the second book is full of stories where people have that background. Now, the fellow she met, the, the, the holy man, the shaman, Credo Mutua, claims, I mean, I, I can't, I cannot, you know, prove or disprove this, but he certainly tells a story of eating some strange gray flesh that he claims was the flesh of a gray alien or the sky people. And it, he said it took him to near death. It was like, it was like a psychedelic experience that lasted months. And um, he came out of it, this kind of gifted shamanic vision, you know, the capable of with psychic skills and capable, capable of vision, you know, and, and, and Denise said she had never met anyone with the, with the, the presence and energy that, that he has. I think he's still alive. He must, this would have been, I mean, he's old now, but um, I'm pretty sure he's still alive and still does interviews and such. Um, 
So yes, yeah, so here's we have this person who had a powerful owl experience, totally symbolic owl experience, had a powerful UFO experience, had a near death experience, and then also um, her experience of of eating the owl feathers ties into so many traditions, uh, you know, the communion tradition of uh, of the Catholic Church and the um, uh, uh, the Bacchanalia traditions of eating of eating the flesh of the god, although symbolically in the form of communion. Um, and in symbolically eating a you know a bowl in the Bacchanalia festival, but there's a rich tradition of taking on the properties of this god in this sacrament of of eating. And she ate the owl feathers and was told that she had taken on the power of the owl, and now she's a psychic. Um, there was one other story I can't remember if it's the first or second book that almost seemed poltergeistish, uh, a lady named Cindy who had some kind of experience where things are flying around in her room and her father comes in and and he experiences it as well. Does that ring a bell? Oh, yes. That's in the second book. Yes. Cindy Dove. Yeah. She's, um, she, she, so this is, um, she had a powerful owl experience, um, very strange where she walked, this is, she walked into the, uh, out of her driveway, she was walking a friend, and both her and her friend like walked up to this owl that was standing on a trash can. It was standing in this frozen pose with its owl with its wings outstretched, and it didn't move. Just and she walked all the way back to the said goodbye to him at the end of the driveway, and walked all the way back and passed it at the garbage can again, still there in that frozen pose. After that, she started having all kinds of UFO experiences, more owl experiences. Uh, this the other owls seemed very normal. Owls passing in front of her and flying over her, and and but unusual. She recognized she had never seen owls before. She started that they were started flying in front of her, and you know, she had a really amazing experience um, where she this new house she moved into had all kinds of odd experiences. One of which was a um, her um, she was in bed reading in full in the afternoon and there was a thud 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 on the wall and there was a um the the nightstand next to her started levitating sort of banging against the bed and against the sort of uh, the, the the wardrobe next to her bed so it's banging around and she gets she jumps out of it and she goes gets her father and her father she still lives with her father her father's elderly she's taking care of her father the um they comes back in She's like, what is going on? And he and and the he climbs under the bed to see if there's like some. There thought there was like some animal somehow stuck and trapped under the bed that was somehow tied or wrapped itself around this nightstand. Nothing happened. Um, the cord from the lamp on the nightstand, the lamp never fell off, even though the nightstand was pounding around in this crazy way. The cord eventually lit on fire, zapped, and then the fire went out. And there's smoke and everything in the room. And as soon as that happened, boom, the nightstand settled down. But she said it was rising off the floor and moving around. It terrified her, freaked her out. So yes, yeah, so here's, this is the, that poltergeist activity, which is something that should be in the realm of, uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, ghost hunting or something shows up in context with this, with this owl and UFO thing. Yeah. So, and she was seeing a lot of strange things in the sky at that house. There's a lot more to that story. Mike Clellan, thanks very much for being here. Interesting conversation. I'm sure we'll have you back again. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.